Hello, U.S. History students. It's Mr. Poole here again, and we are talking about progressive politics today. We're going to address progressive politics by talking about the three progressive presidents, starting with Teddy Roosevelt. It was an act of fate that made him president in the first place. He was actually vice president when William McKinley was assassinated, which made him president. Uh, the Republican Party never wanted him to be president. Uh, in fact, he was considered kind of a loose cannon or a maverick at the time, and they actually put him into the vice presidency because he was a war hero, so he was popular, but they also knew he wouldn't uh, have a lot of power as vice president. But, as history uh, often shows us, one little thing can uh, change an era. Okay, One little thing can spark a movement, and in this case, McKinley's assassinated, Roosevelt, who was a true progressive, actually becomes president and uh, really kicks off the progressive era. So he's known as our first progressive president. His domestic policy is known as the Square Deal. He wanted to come up with a compromise that would be good for workers and businesses. He grew up a very wealthy uh, New Yorker from a very prominent family, but despite his own wealth, he actually saw uh, what a lot of these workers were going through, and he was willing to stand up for them. Um, and he, it was hard to buy him. All right, He was not a politician that was for sale. He didn't want businesses money, and uh, he was willing to stand up for what he thought was right. And so, for example, he supported a minimum wage, a, even though many business leaders were firmly against this. And he also supported... Uh, the invention of the national park system. He was a big conservationist. He was a big outdoorsman. Growing up as a child, he had asthma, was very sick. Uh, so as he gets older and gets a little healthier, uh, he tries to uh, become stronger and stronger by taking up things like boxing and hunting and getting outdoors. Uh, in fact, his dream was to go off to war and fight for his country, which he got to do in the Spanish-American War uh, as the leader of the Rough Riders, which really launched uh, his political career, at least at the national level. Uh, but he loved being outside, and he thought these natural wonders that we had, especially out west, things like Yosemite and the Yosemite Falls, uh, Yellowstone, uh, the Grand Canyon, a big bend, all these natural wonders should be protected and preserved. So not only could he appreciate them, but future Americans, future generations could appreciate them. And the national park system really takes off under Teddy Roosevelt. If it wasn't for him, some of these places could have been lost uh, to the interest of private businesses. Uh, some of the giant trees out west could have been cut down by the logging industry. Some of the uh, rivers could have been dammed. Um, and uh, taken up by uh, various industries and uh, the oil uh, companies, the coal industries could have taken over some of these areas. But he did a lot to protect uh, our natural land, especially out west. Teddy Roosevelt was also uh, very big when it came to regulating monopolies. He thought monopolies were bad for the American consumer. These giant trusts that had been built uh, where they were setting prices at unfair levels, really hurt consumers, really hurt the average American, really hurt farmers in particular. And uh, he earned the nickname the Trust Buster because he broke them up. Okay, things like Standard Oil had to break up. Okay, a lot of the railroads had to break up their trust. And uh, this did a lot for the average American uh, and the average consumer. All right, so people were no longer being charged these unfair prices. We had more competition in the market. So after Roosevelt serves his uh, second term in 1908, uh, he picks William Taft as his predecessor to run in the Republican Party. He trusts that Taft is going to continue his progressive policies. Taft ends up winning the Republican ticket, and he does continue a lot of the policies, especially when it comes to monopolies. But he did a few things that progressives didn't like. He is known as the second of the three progressive presidents. Uh, but he raised tariffs. Okay? Uh, one example is through the Payne-Aldridge bill, which was unpopular with progressives. And the Ballinger-Pinchot uh, dilemma, which involved some corruption at the national level. The Department of Interior, Ballinger, um, did some... Uh, 
unethical things while in office uh, and potentially jeopardize this new park system that had be, uh, been created under Roosevelt. So Roosevelt especially did not like this, and it creates a rift in the Republican Party, a rift between progressives and Taft, uh, and Roosevelt was so upset that he actually decides to run for office, run for president for a third time, which was unprecedented at the time, uh, in 1912. And he wanted to run as a Republican, but he did not win the nomination. So instead, he creates his own third party known as the Progressive Party or the Bull Moose Party. His nickname was the Bull, Bull Moose because he never backed down. He was always a fighter. great example of that was actually on the campaign trail in, in 1912. Uh, he was actually shot while delivering one of his famously long speeches. Uh, and the bullet hit him in the chest, but luckily his speech was folded over in his uh, front pocket, and the bullet went through the speech, and it just missed his heart by a centimeter. Uh, but he was so tough that he got up, and he actually finished the speech before going to the hospital. And he was very much a man's man and uh, prided himself on his toughness and really expanded the scope of the presidency and the fame of the office uh, by being this larger-than-life figure. But he doesn't win in 1912. As third-party uh, tickets often do, it splits one of the major parties, and in this case the Republican Party was split between Roosevelt and between Taft, and this allows the Democrat Woodrow Wilson to win. Woodrow Wilson... And you can see the electoral map right here. Woodrow Wilson was uh, also known as a progressive president. Okay, he's known as the last of the three progressives. All right, we'll see kind of a shift in the other direction in the 1920s. Uh, but Woodrow Wilson did a lot to continue the elimination of trust and monopolies, and he wanted to create this new freedom when it came to economic progressivism. Now, when it came to social progressivism, Wilson uh, was a tough cookie and... He was a notorious racist, uh, so even though he was standing up for progressive policy that really helped a lot of uh, average Americans, uh, he also did things like show Birth of a Nation, which was a uh, horrible movie at the time, silent movie that was basically propaganda for the KKK and really helped to expand the KKK at the time. Um, so Woodrow Wilson and his reputation is scarred by his... Uh, racist beliefs and racist policies. He segregated a lot of the federal government, the post office, uh, wanted to further segregate a lot of the armed forces, um, and was against women's suffrage for a long time until he finally came out for it uh, as he saw the writing on the wall. But Woodrow Wilson, a very interesting character, very much uh, a man of his time, uh, in line with the progressive presidents when it came to economic policy, but not in line with the progressive movement when it came to social progress. You'll learn more about the social progress of the progressive movement next class. Some other things that Woodrow Wilson did, he created the uh, Federal Reserve through the Federal Reserve Act that he signed into law in 1913. Uh, we still have the Federal Reserve and they do a lot to regulate our uh, monetary supply and interest rates in America, uh, and they do this through the various Federal Reserve banks. And it's very complicated, but essentially what this does is it helps get rid of the boom and bust uh, economies of the 1800s, and we're still going to have recessions, or we're going to have a big depression in the 1920s, uh, but having the Federal Reserve uh, puts a uh, kind of another tool in the toolbox of the federal government when it comes to regulating the economy. Okay. So uh, dating back to the 1800s, we start to see early uh, evidence of the progressive movement with the Pendleton Civil Service Act and getting rid of some of this corruption in politics. And this ideology is what leads to and carries through throughout the progressive uh, era, but you need to know the Pendleton Service Act of 1883 okay, that essentially uh, said you can't just give these government jobs to your friends. There must be um, some merit involved. 
And beyond that, uh, we get key amendments, so changes in our Constitution, further evidence of progressive policy passed during the progressive era. So if you'll remember, the Populist Party of the late 1800s wanted an income tax. All right. They wanted to tax wealthier Americans uh, in order to bring more money into the government so the government could do more for the average American. They finally get this with the 16th Amendment. Okay. So the 16th Amendment allows Congress to institute an income tax. And then the 17th Amendment changes how we elect senators. It used to be senators were elected by state government, state legislatures. After the 17th Amendment, uh, they are elected by uh, voters directly. So we have direct election of senators. We also have an income tax. These are political changes to our Constitution that happened during the Progressive Era, and they happen because of the Progressive Movement. So the 17th Amendment is in 1913, okay, uh, and the 16th Amendment is also in 1913. So these are two things that happen on Woodrow Wilson's watch. But we also see a lot of changes at the local level. So at the local level, uh, in city government and state government, we see these new initiatives, uh, these new uh, avenues for average Americans to affect change. The first one's the recall. So because we still have a lot of corruption, the Pendleton Civil Service Act didn't change everything. We still have a lot of corruption. So in order to hold elected officials more accountable, uh, a lot of states institute recalls, so you can actually recall uh, somebody from office before the next election if they do something super egregious, and you could essentially hold a new election. We also see referendums, okay? and this is where voters can approve the, uh, bills that are offered by the legislature. So let's say there's not enough uh, political momentum to pass something in the state legislature, so the legislature opens it up to the voters. Okay, we've seen this in states recently when it comes to things like passing recreational marijuana usage, where the legislature doesn't want to put their reputation on the line when it comes to voting for this, so they'll allow the voters uh, to approve these bills. They'll essentially allow the voters to vote on this. We see this a lot at the local level when it comes to bonds. Uh, the city council will put together a bond uh, or they'll put together a transportation package, a proposition, and then they'll allow the voters to decide if they really want it. Now, kind of the same coin, but the other side, you get a process called the initiative where uh, the people or interest groups or groups of people can come together and actually propose bills and they can force a vote at the state legislature on these bills. Okay, so let's say their bill's not even being proposed, but voters really want this to happen. They could force elected officials to have to vote on this through an initiative, uh, essentially putting it on the docket, uh, and they would, they would then get to see how uh, their representatives voted on these key issues. All right, so you've got recall, referendum, and initiative. These are tools that we see at the local and state level that are introduced during the progressive era to make politics more inclusive, to include the average person more and more uh, when it comes to American democracy. Okay, that's all I have for you for this lecture. Just know that the progressive era really changed how Americans approached politics and it really opened up a lot more opportunities uh, for uh, the average American when it comes to getting involved in the government, whether it's direct election of senators, uh, whether it's giving the government more resources through the income tax, or eventually next class you'll learn about the 19th Amendment where we bring the other half of our population into the equation with women being allowed to vote in 1920. Thanks.